Welcome everybody to our Autumn Country Lunch. You've got people from far and wide. I was just going to say, I hope it's sunny wherever you are, but I can see at the back of Gab's window that it's a typical Robertson day out there. I'd like to welcome Gabriella Holmes, who's the Area Manager, Alcohol and Other Drug Services, South Coast Triple Care Farm, which I have to read out. I can't remember all of that. And Rachel Hill, who's the Art Therapist at Triple Care Farm. I'd also like to tell you that our general manager, Helen Keneally is online and she'll be popping in later, joining the panel for the Q&A session. Um, our country lunch has started several years ago as a physical event, if we can remember those. We were able to invite supporters down to the farm, down in the Highlands a couple of times a year to showcase the program and give everyone a taste of the life-changing program down the, and the work being done, done down there. COVID, of course, has put a stop to that, but out of that challenge, the, these virtual events were born, and it's actually turned out to be a great way to reach more people and to share the work of Triple Care Farm and our foundation with a whole new audience. So nothing beats being together, but we're doing the best we can being apart. So thank you all for joining us. Just quickly, if you're, um, you're, you're all on mute, so please keep yourself muted and turn up your volume so you can hear us. And you can pop your questions in the Q&A box and we'll get to those a little bit later. Now I am going to introduce Gab and welcome Gab and hand over to her. Good morning. Uh, well, just cracked over to good afternoon, uh, depending on which state you're in. Uh, so for those that are joining us for as far afield as Western Australia, good morning. And for those that are across the Eastern Seaboard and New South Wales, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be able to connect with you today, as Anna said, in this very different way, um, whilst uh, it's not as wonderful as being able to be here in person and share a meal and share stories with young people. It's another way that we can stay connected and, and understand this uh, great work that happens at Triple Care Farm. And I really appreciate that you've set aside some time today to find a little bit more out about what happens here at Triple Care Farm and to be able to connect with that. I'd like to be able to talk to you a bit about um, the program in general and, and what this year has brought for us as, as we commence 2021. And then it's going to be wonderful to hear from Rachel about the art therapy program and how that uh, integral part of the program impacts on young people. Um, so I know that for people joining us today, today might be the first time you've heard about Triple Care Farm. For others, it could be the hundredth. And I hope that um, our, our time together today will be important for you, no matter how many times you've connected with us before. Um, but again, just thank you and welcome for joining. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge that we're meeting on Aboriginal land and acknowledge the elders past, present and future and that we're meeting on Aboriginal land across the nation um, in many different places, but I'm meeting on a, a meeting place of the um, Dharawal and uh, Gunungurra people and I acknowledge their elders past, present and future and how special a place it is for them as a traditional meeting place, a place of ceremony and a place where they acknowledge spring, the changing of season, the changing of people. Uh, a big part of what we do here at Triple Care Farm is support young people to make real and lasting change in their lives. Uh, so I've been, uh, I've had the great pleasure of this week being able to serve young people at Triple Care Farm for 21 years. Um, so I started when I was 12. Um, if you were here in person, there would be raucous laughter at the, starting when I was 12, but online the jokes don't float so well. Um, but it's been wonderful to be a part of the journey of change that young people are able to make with the support of the Sir David Martin Foundation. So we work with young people 16 to 24 from throughout Australia, all of whom are struggling with a drug and alcohol addiction um, and are wanting to change. So we're a voluntary program and there's three components as the slides were rolling through, there's three components to our program. We have a Triple Care Farm withdrawal unit that supports up to 10 young people for 28 days um, and is a, a, a provides them with a safe place to withdraw from substances. That team's made up of medical staff, youth work staff um, and uh, social work staff as well. So we really try to provide a holistic support network for young people as they go through that very first step of change. Um, so we, within our component, um, of the withdrawal unit, we have a really diverse skill set. So we have an addiction medicine specialist, Dr. Frank McLeod. 
We also have had a GP join our team this week, Dr. Jessica Lee, um, and we have a clinical nurse educator, Beth Horner, and a nurse uh, education specialist, which will be joining our team in the next month. We have also a number of registered nursing staff, youth work um, and uh, housekeeping staff that, that run that program. Um, and it's been a really successful new model that was launched in 2017. Um, and what we see is some really significant change that young people are able to make through that withdrawal unit. Um, it's a really beautiful place. As you saw, there were some of the photos of the, of the, um, the actual building itself through those initial first slides. Um, it's a really beautiful and safe place. Um, we had a, a young man who'd finished the program um, at the end of last month uh, in the withdrawal unit was moving into resi rehab and I just asked him what did he think of the program and he said um, it was just beautiful he'd never had his own room never had his own space um, in fact he said oh, I've just been sleeping on the lounge at, at my place um, and he has a very very large family so having a bathroom of his own was something that he never thought would he would be worth um, so I think for him, stepping out of that space, he felt really value in having that respectful and beautiful space to be able to withdraw in with some really supportive staff. Young people may then move on to our Resi Rehab program, which runs for 12 weeks, same age group. Um, so we've got uh, a, a holistic program in the Resi Rehab and it runs for about 12 weeks. That can be flexible, it's client-centred, so it's as long or as short as that young person might need. And that includes uh, a living skills program um, where they're taught to build up their independent living skills. It includes uh, counselling, individual and group counselling and art therapy, and I'm not going to steal Rachel's thunder, she can tell you all about that. Uh, we also have a caseworker who helps them develop their individual goals, a music uh, program, and on the weekend we have sport and rec. We also do some training, so we do education um, around building young people's skill sets so that they've got confidence in their literacy and numeracy skills. We also provide a certificate too for skills for work and training, which includes a barista qualification uh, and includes a sandwich making qualification, which are great skills to have to step into the hospitality industry which is starting to grow again now as an opportunity for young people to gain employment. We then support young people for six months in the community. And this is a really integral part of the program. Um, the change is possible because of their participation in the residential program, but it's sustained long-term by that community support for six months after they leave. Um, it's really wonderful to be able to talk a little bit about that. And we're gonna have time for some Q and A at the end. Um, but I thought it would be really great to be able to share with you some of the outcomes from 2019. So who did we see and, and what were the outcomes that they were able to achieve? The reason why I'm sharing with you the 2019 outcomes is that includes their six months um, outcomes. So after they've completed the aftercare program. And so we get that information in June the following year. So this is our most current data for what changes young people have been able to make. Um, so in 2019, we had 118 participants in the withdrawal unit and 99 in the residential rehab unit. For the young people that participated in the withdrawal unit, we had 61% uh, complete that program and 55 moved directly into the residential program at Triple Care Farm. Our goal isn't necessarily for every young person to do both components. Our goal for that program is to get young people into long-term treatment whichever that might be for them. It could be um, uh, counselling in the community, it could be different programs in the community, or it could be residential treatment here. What we saw at the conclusion of the aftercare program was 57% had maintained their drug and alcohol use goals. We saw a 75% reduction in hospitalisation for mental health and AOD use. 60% had gained um, further treatment in the community. 54% had gained employment and a further 25% had engaged in further training and no young person was identified as being homeless. These are fantastic outcomes for those young people, really great change happening over that time. For the group of young people that completed the residential rehab program as well, we saw at the conclusion of that, um, that around 35% uh, had gained employment and education and training. 94% had stable accommodation. Criminal activity had reduced from 60% to zero. 
and chronic substance use had reduced from 100% to 14%, which is phenomenal. We also saw a really significant reduction in thoughts of suicide from 55% of people experiencing those thoughts prior to coming into the program to 11%. Really remarkable changes. And often the young people that are doing both parts of the program are presenting with some far more complex needs. But to bring that to life a little bit, I'd like to share a story from a mum. So at the end of February, I received an email from a mum that wanted to update me about her daughter, Jennifer, who was in the program a few years ago and what had changed for her since she'd left. So I'd like to read that email to you if you wouldn't mind. I was writing just to give you an update on my daughter. Since leaving Triple Care Farm, she was able to secure independent accommodation and began searching for jobs everywhere. Her only form of transport was a bike and she literally rode it everywhere. Jobs were hard to come by, but she eventually gained casual employment at the local Hungry Jack's store. She worked hard and saved even harder. She also busied herself by attending the local gym every day, even winning a fitness competition there. She'd always wanted to work in childcare, but had drifted away from that goal for a while. And during 2019, while still working at Hungry Jack's, she signed up to do a certificate three in childcare and immediately gained casual work in the childcare service. At this stage, she was juggling the equivalent of two full-time jobs, saving hard and still riding her bike everywhere. At the end of 2019, she applied for a childcare job that she was not quite qualified yet, but aced the interview and got the job. She then left Hungry Jacks to concentrate on this new career. Realising a bike was not the most practical form of transport, she got her motorcycle L's and started practising. Unfortunately, the day before she was due to sit her P's, she was hit by a car. That didn't stop her though. She went for her P's the next day and got them. She then bought herself a brand new motorbike. Now with her new set of wheels and a new job, she began to settle and thrive. She had always wanted her own house and had saved a substantial deposit. Earlier this year, she and her partner bought their first house together. Last week, she completed her certificate three in childcare and is now fully qualified and is becoming an amazing educator. She bought a small car and has been practicing to get her driver's license. She's now only 22 years old. I never cease to be amazed at what she achieved during the last four years. She still speaks fondly of TCF, a place where she found herself and reconnected with life. We are forever grateful and just thought you might like to know how she's doing. I know I was overwhelmed to know how she was doing, to know that the change that we helped her make four years ago has set her on this path with confidence and success. This is the change that's possible through our partnership with you through the Sir David Martin Foundation. Thank you. Oh, Gab, thank you for that. That's a beautiful story. What a go-getter she is. Absolutely. And I know you've said in the past that the young people, they, they have the same priorities that we have. All they want is a job, somewhere to live, and someone to love. Is that the third one? A home, a job, and a family. There you go. Wow, good for her. Thank you for sharing that. That was beautiful. My pleasure. Now we're going over to Rachel, who's sitting quietly there, surrounded by beautiful artworks. Thanks, Gab. That was lovely. Welcome, Rachel. Thanks, Anna. It's lovely to be here. Oh, good. Could you please tell us how long you've been at Triple Care Farm and a little bit about the art therapy program in general? And I see you sent us some slides, which is brilliant. Yes. So you can talk to them as we go. Wonderful, thank you. Um, yes, so this is my fourth year at Triple Care Farm. So I started here um, with my during my clinical placement of Master of Art Therapy at the Western Sydney University in my final year. Um, so the art program here at Triple Care Farm supports and complements the counselling stream. So as a, like an alternative to talking therapies, art therapy is an opportunity to um, put in like a non-verbal way, emotions, 
experiences that might be difficult to put into words. Um, so we have, we offer both individual and group art therapy and um, art therapy. So with the directive art therapy, that's like following more of like a set activity. So it might be that we're going out looking at nature art therapy. It could be like a guided meditation followed by a mindfulness walk and then creating art in nature. And we're so like fortunate to be where we are. There's nature everywhere and there's so many benefits associated with that. Or it could be, as you can see in the example, um, create a mask. So it might be something you show to the world or something you hide from the world. So the mask activity is quite beneficial for students looking at different you know, forms of identity and it is changing parts of their life. And then we've got the picture of the art room. So open art is more of like a non-directive art therapy. And that's where it's kind of following the lead of what the students would like to do. So it's developing their own interests and it could be um, more like a skills-based activity. Sometimes it's doing sculpture, clay, uh, at the moment, stencil t-shirts and tie-dye activities, they're kind of trending at the moment. They're very popular. So we have what we call tie-dye Friday, where we kind of all turn up in our tie-dye. And um, it can be quite a you know fun, vibrant space in that area. Yeah. Great. Who knew tie-dye was ever coming back? Um. <laughs> Rhetorical question. So what, what are the, some of the main benefits of art therapy, especially for young people who are in recovery and often have experienced significant trauma? Is it more about the process of creating the artwork or finishing the artwork, do you think? Yes, so um, it does vary. So uh, there's an example here of a chalk pastel drawing, um, but I'll just kind of take you through some of the, like the main benefits Benefits. So we'll talk more about these a bit later with other slides. Um, but one of the main benefits is like the tactile nature of working with art materials can be very helpful working with um, self-regulation. If we think about like neurobiology now, lots of studies are showing that it can really calm the nervous system, which can be very beneficial for students. If they present with distress, agitation, um, uh, for example, one student I was working with, his leg would constantly shake and he reflected that during drawing and art therapy, his leg had just stopped shaking. So they're kind of like those small um, but significant impacts for the young people. Um, so what can happen is with working with substance use disorders in particular, art therapy is very beneficial in that it gives an opportunity to work with the unconscious, subconscious. It can be a way to internalise, sorry, externalise what's internal. So if you have a look at this example here, this particular student I worked with for a couple of months, um, it was like a what we call a storyboard. So the idea of this is to look at a different narrative and a parallel kind of way of um, regaining symbolic control of something that was out of felt like so overwhelming for her um, dependence on alcohol. She felt like she was drowning in that. Um, she did about 50 sketches while she was here. And over that time, it was a way for her to look at the monster was actually how she perceived um, this dependence on alcohol. And you can see by the scale of the monster, this is the small figure is actually the students like a self portrait and it's being bottle fed wine. So this massive monster is overpowering her. Then over time, this is only a selection, she's got many drawings, the monster shrinks. And for her, it was a way of kind of like regaining that control. Um, and the final one, it's like, you know, she's going to drop this monster. She no longer wants that in her life. She says, I can, I control you now. And there's colour back in the work, which is significant too. So that's some examples of um, process-oriented art therapy where this artwork's not something we're going to hang up on the wall and display in a gallery. This is about art therapy in the concept of, um, as in counselling, like where you have your files that are confidential. It is, it's considered like that and it's stored in a, a confidential space. Wow, and you would never get, you would never be able to work through that process quite so easy just talking about it, but putting it in visuals for her, it's, it 
really tells a story, doesn't it? Yes, and that's when um, working with trauma experience is very significant mm -hmm. because um, these students, particularly the image before about the accident, reflected that um, had engaged previously in lots of different forms of counselling but was unsuccessful because trauma is sometimes uh, like a non-linear experience. It could be symbolic or visual. It's not always verbal. Mm -hmm. That's where art therapy can be very beneficial. Mm. Mm. Great. So art therapy can cover many different forms of expression. Can you tell us a little about the media you most use in the program and what are the most popular with your students? And we'd also yes. love to hear about the less conventional media and how you use them. Um, so this one is pendulum painting. So um, at the moment, we've got a couple of activities that are very popular with the students. We often try to get outside as much as possible and work in the environment because we find that in itself is you know, rejuvenating and quite healing. Um, this one here is pendulum. So the idea is to get a container, fill it with paint, um, suspend it from a string, and then gently push the container and it will over time form um, like a rhythm, a motion, a pendulum. So the paint will actually drip out of that onto the canvas and um, makes these incredible different patterns. So the idea of this is a collaborative work. So students work together and um, it doesn't always work. So mm -hmm. this might have been one that worked out of 20 of them. So it's definitely a lot about the process. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, the next one, we if there's a slide, I think yep. of, um, yep, this one here, if you can see the string, sorry, the, like it's a chain, we can use string as well. Um, once again, a couple of students were working on this one. So a shared experience using a chain and you drag the chain along and it makes different patterns. Um, and there's another example there with a bit of flicking of paint in the background with their hands. Um, yeah, this one here is the flow painting using a strainer. If you can see that they're actually sink strainers, you pour different mediums in and colour and pattern comes out. This type of work is particularly useful for students that um, if they're, if they're finding like just in regards to um, feeling like in a low mood or they might be experiencing um, like there's a lot, lot of kind of self-loathing that can happen and they've disconnected from enjoyment in life without the, you know, using substance. So this is a way for them to engage with peers and find a bit of joy and it just brings them to a different experience. And colour, working with colour can just shift your mood too. I can imagine. Well, over the years, we've seen some incredible artwork coming from the Triple Care Farm students. And clearly there are many who are budding artists before they come to the farm, to the program. Um, do you have young people who are initially reluctant to get involved? And how do you overcome this? Yes, so um, many students actually turn up reluctant. Um, getting to know them over time, often it's it can be a defence because they've been hurt in the past. Yeah. They've been told that their art is no good. Mm -hmm. They've had their work ripped up at school. I've even heard a, a student mentioning a body of work was put into a furnace. So yeah. it, it can take, yeah, it can take time to build up that trust and relationship for them to feel that it's safe. So having, I think the art room in itself, having um, like a diverse range of um, artworks that they can kind of relate to, and also, um, for example, one student I was working with, he announced when he walked in that uh, he wasn't creative and didn't like art, but as he was talking, he was actually fiddling in his hands with a bit of paper and on a closer look, it was um, like a chewing gum wrapper and he had made the smallest origami bird that I've ever seen. And in itself, the creativity is there in the room, but it can just take a while, for, I can see it, but they need to believe it after a while that they've actually got that within them. Mm. Um, yeah yeah the art room is a very it, it is it's a sa extra safe space within the safe place of the farm I think yes yeah it is yeah so what would you say are some of the most common misconceptions that people in the broader community might have about the young people that you work with at Triple Care Farm yeah so I would say that um I'm just thinking like there is a lot of stigma, you know, related to substance use disorder um, and that there's kind of like an unconscious or negative bias that puts the blame on the individual. And um, I just think, you know, it doesn't take into consideration the complexities of substance use disorder like 
intergenerational trauma, exclusion, um, you know, it might be inequities of resources. So um, it, that only kind of perpetuates barriers. These young people already feel shame and, um, yeah, so it's not helpful. Mm. Mm. We know that the students at the farm are on a journey of self-awareness and you and re-engaging with learning and education, but have, it, have the students taught you anything at the farm that you'd be happy to share with us? Absolutely. Um, so I'm constantly learning something. So the young people are um, just inspired by, you know, the amount of knowledge and um, of resources that they bring with them. Um, like practical level, I've learned, actually one student, I just think of an example, um, he would set up his painting easel but before he painted he liked to show me how to rap um, break dance so um, over time I've learned like there's a crab walk and there's a hand freeze glide I haven't put these into practice but I'm just always amazed at all the different skills that I learn um, but I'm thinking like more of like an interpersonal level I think I've learned that students really also pick up on the small things that you do for them so it can make a huge difference and they're really perceptive to sometimes those non-verbal things like just remembering their favorite art shirt we've got a selection of Hawaiian shirts so it might be leaving that out for the student and you can see that ah oh, you've remembered that's my favorite shirt um, yes but there was a quote I think slide Eight, for me that sums that up it's when you thought I wasn't looking I saw that you cared and I wanted to be everything that I could be so that's an excerpt from a poem I think it's very um, pertinent to the type of work that happens in the art room with the students yeah that's wonderful is there anything else you'd like to add about the program Rachel before we go to the Q&A Yes, um, just that last slide again. That's an example of um, some artwork that we have at Mental Health Month in October. So every year, except last year with COVID, um, we, so students have an opportunity to put their work in the community and this gives them a sense of achievement and re-engaging with community, um, a sense of pride as well. And we also have a shared space in Barrel of a mural um, and a former student, Ellie, has a beautiful mural there at the moment. So I encourage anyone if they could get there to have a look. Um, maybe we could send the link further on to the location. Sure can. Well, I'll be sending out an email um, subsequently after this, after our lunch. So I'll um, I'll pop the link in there and I'll also, yeah, and just, yeah, that'd be perfect. I'm sure people would right. love to see it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rachel. That was just, that's really interesting. And thank you for all your work down there. Thanks. And I'm I sure that, sorry. I was gonna say one of the other links you might wanna send out to participants if they were interested is a link to our 2020 graduation ceremony. Yes. Um, as, as Rachel said, lots of things were different last year because of the impact of the uh, coronavirus. Mm. And so one of the things that we do to celebrate the change young people have made is we normally hold a, a graduation ceremony that brings everybody together, young people, their families, their supporters, people from the foundation, people that are um, really keen to be a part of celebrating that change for young people. And we normally come together. Um, obviously last year, that was a really unsafe thing to do because of managing the virus. Um, mm -hmm. But what we were able to do was celebrate using um, a, an online platform. So we actually had a really beautiful ceremony that celebrated each individual young person that finished the program last year and had a, both a parent and a young person share their story. And now that's available online and it's about an hour, but it's a really beautiful way of connecting with the change that was possible last year. Um, I guess the other thing that's changed is that for us, we're starting to um, really live in COVID normal. So we, we're back at full capacity for our client numbers. So all of our beds are open, whereas last year we had reduced capacity because of social distancing. Um, we're able to um, open up some beds, um, which is really great news. We still have to be very conscious of managing the virus and the uh, risk of the virus. Um, and there's lots of protocols in place for us to be able to do that. We're still limiting lots of visitors um, just to kind of make sure that we're able to just keep running the core program. Um, but things are starting to get a little bit back to what this COVID normal will be. Mm. Yeah, good okay. point. So 
So normal is never going to be normal again. It's just going no. to be COVID normal, but, but you're managing that mm. in a really safe way. Mm. Mm, absolutely. Mm. Well, we've got some questions here. The first one is for Helen. Is, have we got Helen in the panel ready to speak? It's uh, coming online. Okay. Maybe I um, maybe I threw a curveball. Well, we can wait for Helen. I'm, I, I'm at, oh, here she is. I'm here. I've been promoted to being a panelist. It's the oh, best part of my is. year so far. Thank you. Very good. Well, the first question is for you, Helen, which is what are some of the challenges facing young people in crisis who want to get well? Oh, wow. Well, that's a big question when I've got um, I've got Gab in the room, who's the expert in this field. But uh, can I first say, wow, that was a fabulous presentation. Uh, thanks, Gab, as always. And Rachel, I've learned so much. It was just beautiful, the, the, the storytelling behind the art. So thank you. That was amazing. Um, look, yes, hasn't it been a strange year? Um, and Gab and I have chatted quite a lot about um, the complexities of the young people that have been coming for help and volunteering to come forward to get well in the last year. Um, I think we should probably start by setting the scene and even though we've been very fortunate in many parts of Australia not to have the disease of COVID the, um, in, in the scale that it has been the rest of the world, the impact of isolation and lack of connectivity um, has had a huge uh, impression on young people. Um, you know, as much as technology has allowed a, a greater connection, um, another sort of industry that has grown within this time has been drug dealing. And uh, there has been also, let's be honest, a greater demand when everyone has uh, been, been challenged in different ways. Um, young people who are already vulnerable are experiencing higher levels of domestic violence. Um, a, a great sense of uncertainty with not knowing um, what, uh, whether they'll have enough money to pay their bills, uh, whether they will have a job and what their education pathways are. So, you know, I, I, I think on top of what we saw beforehand, we're looking at an incredibly grave, uh, brave a um, great situation and a brave bunch of young people who have come forward for help. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, the, the issue was was huge beforehand and um, it's it's greater now in its complexity. But congratulations to Gab and all of the staff at Triple Care Farm for um, for supporting all those young people and never shutting the program that is something we should be jumping up and down and celebrating because there there were many um community services that could not um deliver on their programs uh, across australia so well done gab that's really good news yeah um here's a question for rachel from one of, one of our attendees do students resist art therapy believing that it won't help their aod addiction their alcohol and other drug addiction i haven't experienced um any you know, like a young person actually say that or experience that um perhaps that might fall into perhaps more like the reluctancy to engage Sometimes we don't know why it could like being from a negative experience in the past. But we do, with the counselling team, they have dialectical behavioural therapy here. And there are many skills in that that, the, you know, the evidence shows that it does help um, substance use disorders. And uh, some of the art processes we do actually um, incorporate those as well. So if that's um, like a specific goal of theirs, we try to incorporate that into the art pro program. Mm. Cool. And here's another one for you, Rachel, while I've got you. Do any of the Aboriginal students or those from other cultural backgrounds ever bring any shades of their culture into their artwork? Absolutely. It's about them. So if it wasn't about what who they are and what their life is, then it wouldn't be meaningful to them. And that's what I'm finding. You can have so many different art projects, but if they can't relate to it, it doesn't have any point for them. So yes, we're um, students at the moment where they're kind of re-engaging. One student I'm working with showed me a painting she did, Mother's an Artist. Um, 
and just like with totems um, there's a lot of connection to family there but she hasn't painted for about I think it was eight years uh, so slowly she's coming back into the art room and now we've got a canvas and um, yeah so it, it can take time but it's definitely there. Mm. Right. Um, Gab here's a question for you do you find that young people refer other young people to triple care farm? Yes, we do. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, if there's positive young people have got that positive word of mouth that they um, said, look, this has worked for me, it could work for you too. And um, that's often one of the kind of most significant referrals if a young person says it's okay. Um, we actually, as young people finish up the program here, we ask them to provide us some feedback in an anonymous feedback form that each young person's given. And one of the questions that we ask young people is, would you recommend this program to other young people? And 100% of young people say they will. Um, so they might have other feedback about areas that we can grow and develop. And, and, you know, that's always really great. But bottom line is, did they get help? Would they recommend it to somebody else? And 100% say yes. So that's always really encouraging. That's a great testament to the program. Hi, Anna. Can I just add, add to Gab's comments? Because I think it's a, it's a good opportunity to call out um, one fantastic um, graduate of Triple Care Farm, um, Ellie, who has been our youth ambassador for the last year in our, in our year of celebration. Um, Ellie has been nominated Mm. for um, the New South Wales ACT Channel 7 Young Achiever of the Year Award, mm. uh, which is a huge deal. Uh, it's quite a fantastic deal. She actually has to turn up to a ceremony at the end of April um, with a lot of other wonderful um, young candidates. Um, but, you know, we are so proud of what Ellie has done and she started her journey very much through art therapy and is a hugely talented artist. Um, I would encourage anyone who um, would like to, I suppose, support Ellie and encourage, uh, I suppose, her and her referral to other young people to come forward and let them know the treatment does work and um, to go to our website or our um, social media and you can vote for Ellie. Um, it's one of those, yes, you have to go on and vote. Uh, Anna told me yesterday, you can vote every day, apparently, which is good. Oh. Yes, I know. So, um, so yeah, it, it's, it's the only time you're encouraging everybody, quick, get on your social media. But it would be great uh, if you can spread the word on that and share it through your socials, because we would love for her to win, because she really deserves to. And mm -hmm. Ellie, I think you might be in the audience, so woohoo, and I'll see you at the ceremony. Hmm. Thanks, Helen. Yes, Ellie, we're very proud of you, but I'll also be at the ceremony. And we'll be voting once a day, every day, but probably not more than that, but that would be overkill. Um, Gab, there's another question popped in for you. You spoke earlier of hearing back from a parent, and that was such a lovely moving letter. Do you often hear back from past graduates or families and how satisfying is that for you and your staff? Mm. Yeah, so it's, we do have young people kind of reach out and let us know, I've got married, I'm having a baby, I've got a job, um, and that's really lovely. We had a young man reach out today and he's um, gone into bodybuilding. Um, it's, it, I mean, it's a very special area of athletics and he's excelling really well in that area and he shared with us some of the posts and that was really exciting to kind of see where he's at. Um, it is really fantastic to hear about how our little part of their life has made a positive impact for them long term, that kind of drop in, drop in the water and that, that growth that then happens for them, where there's, where there's little point in time and it just has this massive effect for that young person and their families. Um, the, the letter that I showed, uh, that I shared before, a young lady was a very, very... Um, she was in a really difficult spot and she had lots of really difficult and challenging behaviours. So kind of hearing that that's where her life has uh, blossomed to was enormously rewarding. And I guess part of why 21 years later, here I am. Congratulations on being 21, Gabby. <laughs> and we know you started when you were 12. Mm -hmm. We're all laughing, don't worry. Mm -hmm. And the flip side of that might be that the young people don't want to keep in touch because rehab is kind of, I've done that, I've moved on, you know, don't need to talk about. Do you, do you find that as well? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and each young person's different. Some people want to stay connected. They want to keep coming back and telling us where they're at and what's happening. Um, I, I, I know of one young lady that still reaches out after a very long time. I think after about 15 years, she still kind of reaches out and says where she's at. But then there's a number of young people that really want to be able to move on and both are okay. Both are really appropriate, um, so, you know, different for different people, whether they want to continue to think about that part of their life or they want to be able to move on, um, and both are great. You know, last year when we were going through our 30-year celebration, I received an email, and it was a graduate, um, a gentleman who chose to remain anonymous and didn't want to stay in touch but couldn't not reach out and thank Lady Martin and the foundation because he was a graduate from 20 years ago mm. and he had you know a successful life and a happy life and he pretty much was saying you you know you saved my life mm. so that was amazing and you know that's if someone gives you a gift like that that's a joy mm. and then mm. be free to go on and live your life do do what mm. you need to do wonderful mm. absolutely um, here's a question for you, Gab. Are students ready to leave after their three months in rehab? Um, are they ready to leave or do some fear going back to communities that may not be conducive to ongoing recovery? Mm, great question. So there are normally some anxieties around stepping out of the program. Um, but what we aim to do is help develop a placement plan with the young person. So um, from fairly early on in their journey here, we're talking to them about the next step so that takes some of that fear away. We're supporting them to make positive, strong connections in the community, whether that's going back to a community that has challenges with some good supports in place or whether that's going to a brand spanking new area and rebuilding. Um, so it's really normal but that's something that we plan for with the young person. Um, and also they know we're gonna be there to provide them with support in the aftercare program, which is why that component is really critical. Um, so it's not a surprise for them that they're going to be leaving. They're not here for a long time, 12 weeks goes past in a flash. So what we're really working with them on is building up a great plan, activating their resources to have them that plan in place and ready for when they um, are ready to leave. As I said, it can be flexible. So say a young person is at week 12 and there's still a little bit left for them to do. We can extend their time in the program, um, but we tend to do not much longer than kind of 16 weeks at a maximum because we're not a long-term residential program and we don't want young people to be so fearful of that that they're not able to step back in the community. I guess there'd be an ele element of becoming a little bit too attached to everybody and finding that safe place for change is just mm. too nice to leave. Mm. Mm. Um, we do have young people practice by going on weekend leave as they mm -hmm. move through the program so that they are still able to connect with, get out and practice those skills um, so that they're not coming, they're coming kind of that institutionalised experience. Mm. I think that practicing would be so useful. Mm. And I'm sure they come back on Monday mornings and just let you know all the things that they need extra support with and yeah. in order to get it right. That's right. Okay, we've got one last question for Rachel and then I'll throw to Helen to finish with a bit of a wrap up. Um, Rachel, do you know if any students keep up their art therapy once they leave TCF? Yes, yes, they do. Um, and this could be... Um, in various forms. So for example, uh, for some people, it's actually just the process of creating art in their own form of doing that is, can be like a form of therapy. Um, or there's the kind of guided therapy where you will see an art therapist, or it could be group counseling. And that could even go into like music therapy or dance therapy or expressive arts therapy or narrative therapy. So there's so many possibilities for creativity with the therapy. Um, yeah, so it's just a matter of sometimes maybe they haven't tried it before and that can kind of give them an insight into what it can do. I've just seen one last question over here. I'm just going to, um, for you, Gab, um, mm -hmm. do the young people have excursions as community relations manager from the Talawara Power Station? We love to show students around our site and might mm -hmm. find budding engineers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Pre-COVID, we did 
but uh, we have been doing limited kind of community activities, but that's definitely something that we'd be interested in. Cool, we can put you in touch. That'd be great. Thank you, Gab. Thank you, Rachel. I'm going to hand back to Helen. And before I go and say thank you, thank you for everyone for attending and also to Nat and Jen for putting this together because they're so much cleverer than I am. So thanks, guys. And here's Helen. My pleasure. Thanks, Anna. And uh, yeah, to the small uh, but mighty team behind the scenes. Um, we're a very small team at Sir David Martin Foundation, but yeah, everyone does a great job. So thanks, guys. Um, thanks so much, Gab. You're always so good giving us your time, um, not just in the face-to-face, -face, but behind the scenes as well. We're always so grateful. Um, and Rachel, it's a delight to, to meet you and to hear all about it. It's been really, really fascinating. Um, I, I think I'm going to have to think a little bit more about that dragging the chain technique <laughs> because it brought up so many visual analogies in my brain, many of which did relate to the last year. Um, so yeah, that's I've never heard that before. So that's fascinating. I'll keep thinking on that one. Um, thanks so thank much. And um, thank you to everyone at, at Mission Australia. Uh, we, we're very lucky we've got great partners um, with a, a really robust national community service provider like Mission. So thanks so much, guys. And um, to all of our donors, we wouldn't all still be here after 30 years if it wasn't for our donors. And um, uh, to Lady Martin and the rest of the Martin family, thanks so much. Um, and I think really the, the big shout out I, I would like to make is to the young people, because, whoa, it has been a year. And to every young person that's ever gone through the program, but particularly those that have in these challenging times made that brave step. Um, we, we talked a bit earlier about the isolation and lack of connection, but I think taking that first step and asking for help is so very important and well done everyone in the program and who's gone through it so far for doing that because that's just amazing and if any of our audience do know troubled young people there really is help and um, we've got some uh, details on our website that are, are immediate if they don't need triple care farms straight away and um, please go and have a look we know that treatment works and um, we, we are constantly encouraging young people to reach out and get the help um, that they can. So thanks ever so much, everyone, and have uh, a great rest of the day and uh, another great country lunch. Thanks a lot. See you guys. Bye. Thank you.